Welcome to your unorthodox panel on data science and collaboration. I appreciate everybody spending the time to be here because I think we all know as data science leaders that if we're not good at collaborating with the people who are going to use our products, we get about this much done. We can be as good as we want at math, we can be as good as we want at coding, but if we can't work with the constituencies that are going to utilize our products, it just doesn't matter. So we are fortunate to have a fantastic panel with us today. I think what's exciting about this group in particular is that we represent a broad range of company sizes, of company types, um, data science group uh, uh, size as well. And so you're going to get a variety of different perspectives. So before we uh, get into intros, I'll, I'll kick this off. So my name is Nancy Hirsch. And I am the founder of Applied Analytics. Uh, we're a consulting firm that does leadership for data science and analytics. Uh, prior to that, I worked at uh, Opower, where I led the data science and analytics team. And Opower is a company that uses data science in combination with behavioral science in order to enable people to reduce their energy consumption. Let's go down the line. Patrick. I'm Patrick Harrison. I lead a data science group in S&P Global, and I believe I'm the established company representative on the panel here. S&P Global has been around for over 150 years. I haven't been with the company for that whole time, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that leading a data science group in a, a company that's been around for more than a century and is a, a large Fortune 500 operation brings some unique challenges. That's so interesting. So I'm Eleanor Graywall. I lead the data science team at Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb uh, is probably smaller and younger than S&P at this point. I think we're about 10 years old and have about 4,000 people. Uh, I joined the company about six years ago, and at the time our data science function was five people, and now we're over 120. So a lot of growth over that time period and uh, a lot of needs for collaboration with many different types of stakeholders. And um, so collaboration in this kind of fastly, fast evolving and growing uh, organization. I'm going to pass the water first. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Sivan. Uh, I uh, lead data science in a tiny, tiny startup called Wellio. So I think we're in, in a trend order, right? In a trend order. So I am in the smallest company. We're 11 people. And uh, Wellio uh, works on recommendation systems for food, helping people make decisions about food and seeing the impact of food on their behavior and health and things like that. Uh, before Wellio, I was in another startup that got bought. Um, that startup was um, the Climate Corporation, which is a little bit more well known, I think, I hope. It was in the ag, uh, ag tech space. And when I joined Climate, I was an independent contributor there. And by the time I left, I was a director of data science. And we grew the organization from 15 to 80 when I left. And it's a pretty sizable organization. We were also working with uh, the company that bought us, Monsanto, and they had their own data science uh, team. So between them and us, we were over 200 data scientists. Um, so lots of experience in different sizes, I guess. Excellent. So we have about 40 minutes on the clock. Um, and what we're planning to do is to spend about half of our time talking about themes that we all believe are important to effective collaboration and then open it up to the audience for the back half of the time. So, you know, get your pens out and start to scrawl questions as, I, as we talk, I bet we'll prompt some. Um, you'll see on the slide here that there's something at the bottom that I always come back to, and I call it the analytic and data science value chain. And you've seen derivatives of this across the course of the conference over the past couple days. But for me, I find it really, really useful to take any problem and essentially decompose it into these component parts. So just to orient you to it real quick, uh, from left to right, yes, your left, understand the problem. If you don't solve the right problem, it doesn't really matter what you build because it's not going to get used. So that ends up being an incredibly important part of any data science and analytics solution. Second piece, I call it data. And quite frankly, that really, really underserves it because data has so many subcomponents to it, and it's often the hardest part of this whole process. But for today, we'll just think about it as this one piece, data. The third step is analysis. So you're going to use a quantitative technique. It can be super simple or it can be super complex, depending on what you're trying to do. But you're going to use some sort of quant against that data. The fourth step 
interpret. So you've done your quant. What did you learn? What did you find? What does it mean? And then finally, the fifth step is output. And output can take a variety of forms. It can be a piece of software. It can be an API. It might be a data visualization. It could even be a PowerPoint presentation. But you are doing something with all of the work that you've done with the model that you've created in order to bring it to life and create value. So those steps in all I think of as the chain that comprises a lot of the work we do. And what I find in collaboration is that the most difficult parts of this chain and the most important are the ends. So it's how do I make sure I truly understand the problem I'm working on and how do I create output that's going to get used. And those ends of the chain are often overlooked. We often spend a lot of time in the middle and not as many time on the ends. But what I hope we can do today as a panel is not just share our thoughts about this chain, but bring to life some of the tactics and practices that we actually use in real life in order to make collaboration and innovation effective. So let's start with that. I know one of the topics that's on people's minds a lot, and we've heard it at this conference, is how do I ensure that I don't recreate the wheel? I don't want to start from scratch every time. Um, Savan, I know that you had some experience with this. Yeah, so um, both in a very small environment but also in a larger environment, uh, creating memory um, so that you don't repeat yourself. We, we really talked about memory and how we make sure that, you know, when we lose someone, for example, that whatever they ac accumulated over time, the knowledge they accumulated, doesn't just get lost with them. The model they built, the data, where it was, all the information about it. Um, so we created, my experience was that we, you can create artifacts that help you kind of preserve memory. Um, they could be Wikipedia pages. That was part of what we were doing in my previous organization because it was larger and needed that kind of infrastructure. Um, we were also making sure there um, clear documentation of how certain processes work. Um, we had data catalogs. That was another way of preserving kind of the data. And in today's organization, like in, even in a small startup, we make sure that everything we develop is repeatable. So when we make a model with a certain data set um, and with a certain output, and with a certain, even like with a certain business goal that's very clear, everything is uh, documented in Python notebooks, for example, if, it's, if that's the appropriate place, and it's totally reproducible with the click of a button. So it's very easy. Um, I used to work a little bit with Domino platform uh, in my previous company, and it's part of, that was a part of a tool that was helping kind of preserve that memory and uh, re, uh, reproducibility that we really needed in the organization, in the bigger organization. Yeah. And Ellen, I think you do some cool stuff at Airbnb, is that right? Yeah, so, um, you know, similarly faced a lot of challenge as well. And, uh, you know, I think one of the cool things about data science is it's kind of statistics and also engineering. And so a lot of the people who go into it um, get really frustrated by things that are inefficient or are not building upon what you already have. And uh, so a lot of the work that we did early on was to create the right tooling to support that. So it became really easy for people to do. Uh, we noticed that, you know, people were sending their analyses in emails. They had a SQL query in an email, and like that is not a great way to be storing your knowledge. Like, who is on the email? Probably only a few people. How will you get access to that if someone has left or can't find it in their inbox? And um, so we definitely faced that challenge. And uh, the tool that we created is called the Knowledge Repository. We've also open sourced it so you can find it online and implement it in your company. Um, and it's building off of what Sivan mentioned about Python notebooks and um, kind of common languages that data scientists use and uh, uses GitHub as well, which has kind of version control built in, which is really nice, and then has a kind of front end that's like a website that's easy to search and find content. And that's been really helpful for us to be able to um, scale our knowledge and make sure that you're not recreating the wheel, that you can easily find what's been done in the past. And, um, it's really, really helpful. Uh, I'm going to offer the flip side of this, though, which is that you know, in the early days, we didn't have the knowledge repository. And um, you know, part of the challenge is that when you're 
at a stage where you're moving really fast, it actually can be costly to spend time on documentation. And so like there is a reason that there is often technical debt because you actually are like probably rightfully at the time prioritizing like not documenting it because you need to get something out and you know that extra step you can't afford because of the state of your company or whatever stage you're in. Um, and so, you know, there definitely are cases still at Airbnb where we have people emailing things around and maybe it's because they had to move really fast and so they had to like shoot off an email and they didn't have time to go through the peer review process to put it in the knowledge repo and, um, you know, we're, we're okay with that too. Uh, so, you know, we definitely have a slant towards, you know, make sure you, produce, you um, document your work and you share it in the knowledge repo and we try and make that as easy as possible. Um, but I actually do think there's a time and place for not documenting your work. How do you know so. when you hit that inflection point? <laughs> I think that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so we used to say that um, when the data science team was one person, we had all, lots of consistency and it was great. Uh, and the knowledge right repository was right in your head. And we still have cases where, you know, for a given product, it's a new thing, right? And like you know, it might not even be around in a few months, right? So there's like a data scientist working on it and they're working really fast. And I think th that's when we've seen the most k times when, you know, maybe the data scientist is not documenting their work as effectively as they could be in part because it's just one person. So like they're the only person who needs to know about it at the moment. And, uh, you know, they can write it up maybe later once uh, we have the product a little more established. Uh, I'd say that's like generally where we see it be the right trade-off. Um, you know, there also is a tendency for people who, like I, I have seen people who are pretty anti-documentation actually, which is really interesting in data science. They're like, oh, that's like so, um, you know, it takes so much time and uh, so bureaucratic and we're like, but like engineers all have to like review code. Like that's like a standard. So it's definitely an education moment for some people coming into the organization to be like, that's the expectation. And um, if you do a major piece of work that you think will outlast uh, or like, you know, be something that people will build upon that like you do need to write it up. Um, so, you know, we also put it in our performance reviews. Like we ask people to share out their work in that format and we kind of call it out if if it's like, oh, that like probably should be in the knowledge repo, why? Maybe you should write it up. So I think there's a lesson to learn from the open source community here about not reinventing the wheel. And one quote that stuck out to me from Wes McKinney yesterday was the the best code is the code that you don't have to write yourself. And if you think about what what accelerates data science work in general, being able to import pandas or libraries like it vastly accelerates the work that we and our teams do. And we, we take that for granted to a certain extent that these, these tools and libraries exist, but what lessons can you learn from the creation of those libraries and how do those apply to your business? So one thing that we try to do is try to think deliberately about for, for each project that we're working on, what are the bits and pieces of the task at hand that are truly novel and truly related to what we're doing right now? And what bits of functionality are we writing at the moment that are really more general and can be abstracted into a library and, and reused? And, and what, are, what are the key functionalities for your organizations, your projects, your data sources that, that fall into that category? And then actually spend a little bit of extra time and effort the first or second or third time you're working on this to build your own little software library so that the next time you have a project that needs some type of modeling that's distinctive to your business or your data or connect to one of your data sources or whatever, you can do the, the import pandas but for your business. I have something to add. So you said, well, sometimes it's an off offline thing, someone does a tiny little work, it may not be preserved all the way, they may not need a lot of documentation. So we're really a, you know, a 10, 10 person company and we're four data scientists. Um, but I think if you have the right tools, then even the small little projects that are one off, that may not you know, be used many, many more times, they're super easy to document. So. Uh, this is not an endorsement of any sort, but it, currently we're using uh, Google Cloud Platform. Again, I get no, no benefit from t saying this, so don't <laughs> worry. Um, but they, they have truly made it very simple to like, have everything in a single notebook, 
connected to all your data sources, very easily rerunnable, all, everything is dockerized, like things are really easy. And when they're really easy, then it's not a hard lift. That's true. And you never have to send SQL queries and emails because, well, because it's so simple to share the notebook and it's ridiculous. So I think the tooling world is becoming better and better and it will, and this is why Domino becomes an extremely important partner. Uh, and again, I don't work for Domino either, so make no money from that endorsement either. Um, but but they, these tools are getting better. So the process by which we share our information and document and reproduce our information should become easier. And if your organization doesn't feel that way, then your organization is not using the latest technology, I think, at least. Cool. One thing to add to my last point as well is that it takes some discipline to, to stop and think about what parts of this project that I'm working on right now should be abstracted and written into a library, because that will typically make the project that I'm working on right now take a little longer to complete. And also, that's often not a natural and obvious way for data scientists to work, particularly data scientists who didn't come from a conventional software engineering background, where yep. you think about things like modularity and don't repeat yourself. Conventional data scientists tend to think of more linear, let, let me solve the problem and keep hacking away until I've, I've solved this problem at hand. Yep. So, so it's, not, it's not easy or obvious exactly how to do that or when you should, but it, it takes some discipline, but it's worth it. So splitting into components and making sure we're smart about documentation. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's move on to another theme. Uh, how many of you guys went to Jim's talk yesterday? Some folks out there? All right, so this is on the understand the problem theme. I loved this quote that he gave from John Tukey. An approximate answer to the right question is worth a great deal more than a precise answer to the wrong question, right? So how many of you guys have come up with a great answer to the wrong question, and then the work that your team did ended up on the cutting room floor because it wasn't useful? Raise your hands. All right, we got at least 30% of people out there, and the other 70% of you are lying. Um, so here's the question, whose job is this? Whose job is it to make sure that we really understand the problem? Is it the job of the data scientist? We heard yesterday about data translators who play some sort of an intermediate role in between stakeholders and data scientists. Is it a more formal like product manager role, someone who does product management over our data science projects? You know, who should own this? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm happy to start off. Please. Um, you know, this is something that we focused a lot for our data science team at Airbnb. Um, and we talk about the role of a data scientist as having impact at the company. And in order to have impact at the company, you do need to go through that cycle of understanding the problem and picking the right problem and then addressing it using data. And then uh, kind of going that extra step to see a change or something that happens as a result of what you found in yeah. the data. Um, and so the understanding the problem piece is, is critical. And, and I would argue is almost everyone's job to some degree. We actually have this program called Data University. I'm like wearing the t-shirt here, but um, the first class, and we offer it to the whole company, and the first class is actually around uh, defining a problem. And so we teach people the technique of five whys, where you kind of start with the statement and then you ask why and you ask why again. And the idea is to really understand like what is the root of what you're trying to solve. Um, we also talk about how uh, a stated solution is not a problem. Uh, that is, uh, you know, Airbnb users need to be able to split payments. That's a statement. That's not a problem. So, you know, really helping people to understand, like, what, what do we mean by a problem and how do you understand the, the kind of problem behind the problem to make sure you are answering the right question. Yeah. Uh, and so we've been, we've taken the approach of educating everyone at the company about how to ask a good question and identify the problem, and similarly for our data scientists to have that skill set as well. Um, one of the ways that we did it is through Data University. We actually also uh, hired a um, communications lead for our team, and uh, she actually was on the data science team, then became a product manager, and um, is great at communicating and also educating people, and does workshops and works with data scientists around 
um, you know, what are you trying to solve? How do we kind of help you to communicate through this process and, and to train rather than to be an interpreter? Because we do want people to have that ownership of their work and to own their own impact. And so that means equipping them to see it all the way through. Cool. One organizational solve that I've seen, and I'm curious to get the panel's feedback on this, is to take data science organizations and to essentially map them to different stakeholder groups. So you may have one portion of your organization that is aligned to a certain product, a different portion that's aligned to a different product, a third group which is aligned to marketing, a fourth group which is aligned to sales, and so forth. Um, and what that enables you to do is it enables those people to get really deep in the domains that they're mapped to and then work with those groups really closely to make sure they understand deeply the issues that they're facing. What do you guys think about that sort of structure? Like it, hate it? So that's similar to how my group approaches early stage research or prototyping work. Yeah. We've got a couple of, of areas of broad strategic focus where we want to go after projects related to operations automation, for example. And we, as a team, me specifically as a data science leader and also members of the team, will work closely with a senior person in that area who has the business context, understands what impactful problems to solve would be, and, and we work together to try to come to the intersection of what are the impactful business problems to solve and what problems can and should be solved with data science or machine learning. Let's find that intersection and then uh, then we've got got some folks organized that can go after those opportunities. Yeah, yeah. In our um, so in a very small startup, uh, we we have the privilege. I think I have the privilege of working with people who are um, senior data scientists, and it's a small company. So you, I very much explain to them all the time, and I think we all, all the leadership team. Um, talk a lot about the company's priorities, where we're going, you know, it's a, it's a single platform. So we talk a lot about it so that everyone in the company knows it. It's not just the data scientists, the engineers, uh, designer, everyone knows it. So it's very clear what the priorities are. We talk about it in weekly meetings. We, we make sure that people are self-enabled to understand and if they have questions, they can always ask. So I think it's a, it's a small company advantage that we have. In my previous company, where we got to a certain size, it, it became much harder to make sure that everyone's aligned. Oh, there were several products. It's not that easy to understand the product priorities. Um, so there were kind of two things we did. One is fairly simple. The product managers that were hired had to understand certain, they had to be critical thinkers and analytically savvy. It doesn't mean that they need to know how to build a model, but in their interviews, they were actually interviewed by people like me and uh, other data scientists to make sure that they can speak with data scientists, they can understand them, they have experience in this domain. Um, and so they, the most successful product managers were the ones that could actually really well communicate both results and the problems that they were trying to handle on the product side. So that's one side. The other side that we actually built, at a certain point we had um, uh, a team called the model strategy team. And the goal of that team was to kind of help prioritize, uh, understand which models or if it's even worth trying to solve the problem. So they wouldn't run, you know, they wouldn't build sophisticated, complex, several months worth of models. Instead, they would, they would try to understand what's the economic impact of if we could if we could make a difference in the model, improve it by 10%, what would be the impact for our business? What does that actually mean at the bottom line? And that was prior to you know, bringing it to the actual data science teams that would build a more sophisticated model. They would do kind of the if-else analysis. And that helped a lot because at the end of the day, it's, it's, if you ask a data scientist, how much would you, you know, if it's a green field and you've never done anything, it's a little bit easier. You're like, you're gonna get some, some lift. But if you already did a model and now you're trying to understand if, should I invest another six weeks or six months or a year in find, figuring out how to make the model better because maybe it will be a, a big impact. And I know a lot of data scientists are asked, is your model gonna be better? Is it, you know, how, how is the user gonna feel if the search is going to be better? So that, that, that team, that's what they were trying to solve a priori. 
they were trying to say, okay, yeah, if we can improve the accuracy of our ranking model by 10%, then the users would experience this uh, performance improvement, and in return, we believe we will have X dollars more as a company, so or reduce costs by this much. So I think that approach really was innovative in this space. At least I haven't heard of a lot of teams that do things like this, but I think it's a very smart, it, it wasn't my idea, don't worry, but it was a very smart idea. Cool. So I think for finding the right problems to solve, one of the challenges there is that you need to get the business context and the business domain and knowledge of real data science capabilities together into one mind or in at least a small group that can put their heads together and, and put together all the pieces. So particularly in a, a large enterprise where you've got data scientists and you also have all of these operations and product managers who are domain experts and have been in their roles for a long time but aren't data science experts, you can either try to take your data scientists and turn them into business domain experts, or you can try to take your, your business managers and teach them data science, or both. And, and which one do you like? What do you favor? So we try to do both. So on my team, I actually encourage and require team members to network with other departments around the organization. So we've got dozens of other departments that have really well-developed and interesting workflows and products, and just go meet those people. Spend some of your time actually just cold call people, set up meetings, learn about this team, their work, their data. So th that's one approach. And then a, a second approach is really to try to disseminate data science knowledge throughout the organization so that those managers and, and folks who are in the trenches in the lines of business can for themselves identify what are likely to be impactful data science projects, what are the right problems to solve, and bring those to the data science team. And one thing that we're doing there, we, we're perhaps not building our own university just yet, but we've identified an open online course. There are lots of these that are out there. People can go take them for free. You all know about these. But we are organizing a, a cohort within S&P, and we've got something like 100 people who are signed up for this. These are people often with no coding or data science background, but are just very interested in, in learning more about what real data science or machine learning capabilities are. We've organized them together, and they're, they're all going through this same open online course on a schedule, and members of my team are essentially serving as teaching assistants mm -hmm. for this, this open online course. And we schedule and hold guided discussion sections about, this is what we talked about this week. This is Naive Bayes. Here's the Jupyter Notebook that you can complete, and we'll, we'll show you where you went wrong, that, that kind of thing. Cool idea. And, and Domino's actually graciously supported us with that, and that makes running that kind of course uh, a lot easier. Nice. I have a couple of additional themes, but I'm going to take them, and I'm going to put them in my pocket because I want to open it up to the floor and make sure we're hitting the things that you guys care about. All right, I know we have a question right here. I see a hand. Since you guys were just talking about like data university or educating people and stuff like that, like how do you incentivize people to come to these or do you just like put it out there and people are like, data science is cool, I wanna show up? Like how, how do you get buy-in and how do you, um, you know, spread that throughout the organization? Yeah. For, for our part, we just told people we were doing this and two weeks later, 100 people were signed up. Yeah, wow. I think uh, data science is so hot right now and people are truly excited and interested to learn, so that helps a lot. Um, you know, I would say for us, that's been the case for most of the company, but we definitely did uh, some marketing as well to raise awareness uh, because uh, we were looking to educate you know, people in customer support, people in recruiting, people in lots of different fields that, you know, for some, maybe math was a little scary to them growing up, and so we wanted to make sure that it felt really friendly and open, and uh, we actually created a marketing video, which is hilarious, and it's like, uh, it has like testimonials from people in the class, and then all the data university teachers are like jumping in the air at one point, and it was like this like big thing. And um, we had uh, posters and ads all around the office about Data U, and 
like swag like I'm wearing right now and like all the people had t-shirts, we gave stickers, like all these things that you're like, oh, that seems like overkill, but it actually really helps to make it feel like this fun thing that they're participating in. And uh, a lot of people got very excited as a result and I think it felt a lot more accessible and friendly to, to join. Um, the other thing that we did was um, we went to the heads of different departments and we said, you know, this is our plan for Data University. We have these 100 level classes, 200 level, 300 level. Which, which of these skill sets do you feel like are important for people in your area to know? And then we published recommended courses for people in this specific areas to say like, you know, if you're a product manager, you should know about experimentation, you should know about some machine learning topics, you should know how do you find data at Airbnb, and like you should take these classes as a result. And I think that also helped to guide people to the right courses and also to show the kind of buy-in from the top that um, this is what we recommend people should do. Uh, and it's been pretty self-fulfilling. Uh, we have had over a thousand people take classes. Um, you know, the MPS for the courses is really, really high. It's actually like a point of contention now because we did, we send a few people to, we have a bunch of international offices for Airbnb and some of the offices got data university teachers to go, but the, some of them didn't. And then like we get like, sad people. So anyways, it's been really cool to see that. And I think that points to how hungry people are to learn this material. And, um, you know, it's, it's really exciting when you are able to kind of unlock that and, and give people access to these skills. Awesome. One, one more thing is that our, our executive team is really bought in to this. And we, in addition to the, the open online course plan that I described, we've also created our own internal introduction to artificial intelligence and machine learning course. This is like a 45 minute or an hour long module. And that was required and assigned to everyone in our division. So some, some ridiculous number, like 10,000 people have taken this now. And that, that I think really, planted the seed for a lot of folks so that they now have, have context of what this is about. And yes, this is a strategic priority for the organization and that, uh, that, that spurs them to opt in for additional things. Yeah, I, it's not in a company I worked for, but um, there's a company called DoorDash. You may have heard about it. Um, and they, well, I know a little bit of how they work. One of the things they're very proud of is everyone has access to data, everyone. Everyone in the company has access to the, the data sources and can do their own analysis. So there's something to be said about you know, classes and courses and all of that. There's also something to be said about if you, and I'm gonna sound ridiculous because I already answered tools before, but if you have the right tools and they make it simple, then people stop fearing this data science. They stop looking at it as the black box. Oh my God, only geniuses can do models. Um, don't get me wrong, you still need to know what a model is, but you may be able to do cer certain, you know, visualizations of data, like, so if um, you can create an environment, not just like um, teach, but also have tools that will allow people to explore data, kind of quietly without being, you know, evaluated, but just to give them access to it, you'll be surprised how much people will be kind of curious to understand better the customer data. They may not have access to all of this, but understanding the data that, the, the, that they need, uh, people start to, to be very curious because they want to make stories. We want to make stories. We want to have narratives for data, even with, with no like, training in data science. So I really think you can get people excited even with small things. Yeah. All right, next question. Hi. Um, I think we all agree that building off existing work is the best way to go. What I'm curious about is how do you uh, encourage people to acknowledge that what they've done is based on the work of others and share credit and things like that, especially when you're talking about organizations big enough to have multiple independent data science functions. Hmm. I feel like that's been less of a problem that we faced in part because we do have one data science function potentially. and. Um, maybe it's something about like getting a certain uh, certain mass of people who might have been former academics where like citation is such an important part of like what you do so I haven't heard that as a major pain point for us so far but um, you know maybe it will be in the future I'm curious if, if that's something that you've had to tackle and addressed um, maybe at a larger group I had a similar reaction that yeah. that hasn't been a specific pain point for us 
one thing I have done in this area is that this year, for the first time, we put into people's annual goals, uh, a metric that they'll be measured by is the number of reusable components contributed back to the team or contributions to documentation to help recognize the value of that work. Yeah. I I've Great. been in the opposite, I think. So um, in a very large organization I was part of, um, what happened is because the team, like the, the organization wasn't one organization, there were several teams, like orgs of you know, 30, 40, 50, sometimes 80 data scientists, and they're each kind of working independently, more or less. Uh, what tends to happen is you, you want to show that your team, you know, your team is doing the novel things, right? So that you get more funding, right? There's all, it's all kind of connected to the economics of, of how the organization uh, gets incentivized. Um, and so people over, in my, in my opinion, kind of, they tend to oversell they'll say, I invented this amazing one in a kind, and you're like opening, it's like a regression model. So, you know, it, it may be novel for you, but it's like invented many, many years ago in statistics. Um, so actually my experience was the opposite, where people were, you know, overselling what they're doing, and instead had to like, you know, we had to create an opportunity for all the teams to see what other people are doing so that they understand, oh, other people are doing similar things to me. So it's, you know, I'm doing something important, but it may not be, you know, it's not academia. This is not about finding, you know, novel. In 50 years, I found the novel, and I'm going to get Nobel Prize. This is about finding something that's going to impact the business, and maybe a simple regression model will do the trick, and that's it. You're done. And that actually you know, you, you need to learn how to, like, to me, it was more of an incentives. What are the incentives that you're helping your people get in order to um, make them understand that they're making an impact to the business? Um, and it's not about the more complex model or more unique model. It's about, is it the most, is it the best model to solve the problem that you have right now in the most impactful manner that it can, in the time frame that you were given, not a hundred years? So I think you can incentivize people correctly to get there. Yeah. Awesome. I think calling that out is really important too. Like when people do something that's like too complicated, you can say, hey, could you have done this in a simpler way? Like, you know, really making sure that you're closing the loop there to, again, use the right incentives to say like that's what matters more, not like how complex it is. Yeah, there's definitely a hype, right? In AI, deep learning, machine learning, 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 and all sorts of adjectives. Um, so sometimes those are the right things to use and y you should explore those technologies because that's the cutting edge and they are bringing some extremely unique opportunities for businesses. But sometimes, you know, good old plain, you know, linear model will do the trick. Sweet. All right, good conversation. Next, what's up? Sure. Okay, so let's repeat that. So the question was whether we could talk about the uh, layout of the team, so what's the team structure, and then what's, where does the team report? Um, I'm really curious to hear this because I don't think there's any silver bullet out there and every company is doing this differently. Let's see what we get. Patrick. So we roll up to the, the CTO. We're part of the engineering organization. Our, uh, I, I can speak to my team. There are other data science teams that operate in other divisions of the company. Uh, we operate as a, a, I guess you would call it a matrix approach, where all the data scientists in the organization roll up to me, but we form on a project by project or product by product basis, we'll form cross-functional groups that include data and domain experts, someone who operates in a business partner, business stakeholder type role, uh, someone who can speak for the customer, and one or more other technologists, typically, that would uh, be involved in the production software system that whatever machine learning or other data science component that we're building, it would ultimately need to integrate with. So uh, a matrix model like that. Awesome. Uh, we, we also report into the head of engineering, so we're part of the engineering org. And um, I, at one point, started to collect this data in a Google spreadsheet of all the companies in the Valley and where they fit and yeah. how they've changed over time. And, and there definitely is a lot of variation. So I agree with your assessment that yeah. you know, there, there are different ways that people make it work. Yeah. In, um, well, Wellio's 10 people. Our organization, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Just flat. Um, well, mostly. 
But uh, in the Climate Corporation, uh, we were organized by domain. Uh, not by product, but by domain. But each domain kind of owned the product. So for example, um, we had a team around weather modeling. We had a, a team around um, geospatial data. Um, and the reason was, the reason we needed do domains is because the data was so different between domains. Um, and our grouping was uh, kind of statistician machine learning, domain experts, and engineers. So we grouped them together because we thought that's the most effective way of getting them to, to ship things out. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't let, you know, each one of them alone couldn't function really well. They really needed to understand the data. Like weather data is very different than remote sensing data from satellites. Um, and there's some information that can be shared between the teams and they do, they did work together a lot when I was there. But um, there are a lot of things um, that you needed to accumulate knowledge. You, like most of our data scientists were not born in the agriculture world which, you know, there's some companies that you can really, you know, very easily understand the product. You're like, oh, I use it, Airbnb, all the time, makes sense. But in ag tech, I have no idea how to grow a tomato outside my door. And I am developing, or I used to develop, an, you know, a model uh, to recommend what seeds to plant for a farmer in the Midwest in the United States. I'm born in Israel. So my knowledge of how to do it when I joined that company was zero. Uh, I knew how to build models. Um, so by cross-referencing these groups together, we accelerated people's learning and we were able to sort of ship things faster and, and help them learn from each other. Um, is it the best model? No. Was it point of contingency? Sometimes. And it evolved over time, so uh, yeah. I think we're all still figuring this out. <laughs> Great. I think we have time for one more question. What else do we have out there? A quick question on that model strategy team. Uh, it, it's a pretty cool idea around valuing and estimating the value. Like how, before you even get too deep into it, I'm curious if you would speak a little bit more about how they did it and if that's a thing that other teams have considered uh, given your guys' experience. Um, so uh, par part of the reason to assim like assemble a team like that is because it wasn't, um, so, in agriculture, um, the, the, there's, a prob there's a fundamental problem in agriculture, which is you can't get um, feedback from, from your, your tool very fast. It takes a year. It takes a year because you grow corn in the United States only once a year. So you can't get feedback uh, for a year. You're kind of stuck with your decision for a long time. And so it's extremely expensive to spend time developing models that if they don't work. And so the cost is insane. Um, there are other companies, you know, when you do marketing and things like that, you can experiment. You can experiment faster. And if you can experiment faster, the cost of like sending a model out to the world and, and collecting some feedback is, should be reduced as much as possible. Like in Noelia, we, we experiment a lot. It makes it so that the cycle of deciding which models to ship, much easier as a data scientist. But in a company that does agriculture, you can't. You cannot afford to ship a bad model out and wait a year. Um, and so that's sort of why that team was built. It was a necessary thing for the company. Um, it, it used a lot of, like it was a team of, as opposed to the team that I said by domains, that's the only team that was not by domain. It was a team of sort of before all those teams, that team got a hold of you know, whatever data they could um, and um, was building very simple models. I think the, our, our initial idea, uh, or the initial idea of my manager, who was the one who create, created, that, um, created that team or wanted that team, um, was that they, would, they could build simulators. They could build simulators that would, you know, you could ask the question of like, if I, if I do this, I will get X dollars at the end of that. Um, so if you can, and there are, there are lots of academic papers that are trying to quantify economic impact, right? It's, it's, it's a really rich domain in academic. It's just, I feel like in, in the business world, we have not embraced that approach. 
Um, sometimes it's because, yes, the cost of experiments are so low, just do it, just yeah, ship the model and ship another model tomorrow and you know, A, B test it and it's very easy to know which model does better. But if it is expensive, then I think um, w we did these like uh, if-else analysis, fairly simple ones from a statistical standpoint to try to, to quantify the impact of the model. Um, and I bet you your data scientists will know, or a few of the data scientists, you know how to do it. Cool. Um, so that, I think that was the first part of your question. So we're, we're the only thing that's standing in between everybody here and cookies. So I think that means think. it's time cookies. to wrap it up. I hope we have cookies. Macaroons, I we saw I macaroons when we were there, coming. Yeah. Yes. Um, so here's what I heard. I heard that all of our practices end up falling into three main categories. And so these categories may be useful for you guys to think about as you're trying to solve problems. Number one, there's a set of tools, tools that we use in order to accomplish some of these goals. Number two, there's a set of processes. So this is about meetings and communications that we use. And then number three, there are organizational solves. So it's how do we put together our teams in order to try to overcome some of these challenges. And uh, I think uh, solutions across those three lines can help us to get where we need to go in collaborating with other functions. Um, thanks, everybody. Go get some chocolate.